uh, is one of uh, our great alumni. We're very proud of uh, his accomplishment. And I know that Lamashi is going to be introduce you uh, properly here in, in a minute. But uh, Nav's achievement has been great over, over the years. And I would say uh, very accurately that FAA program has improved dramatically under his leadership and along with his uh, uh, colleagues, Dave Brill and uh, uh, Jeff uh, Gannon. I think the team has been done a great job in advancing uh, the FAA pavement program. And uh, Nav, he has been uh, receiving several awards and he's currently the chair of the AAC Airfield uh, Pavement. And recently he became a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Nav, I'm gonna leave Lama to introduce you, but I thought that I will take a minute here uh, to uh, say hi and introduce a very dear friend. And we're very, very proud of you as uh, a U of I alumnus, and we're very pleased to have you with us here today. Lama. Well, thank you very much, Professor. So, um, hello. Sorry, I was muted. Um, hello, everyone. So today for our head seminar, we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Gark. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know him, uh, he's been really helping out with, with uh, all the students here. We, we reach out to him. He's very responsive. Uh, but officially, he is a, a program manager in the airport technology R&D branch. Um, at FAA's Technical Center. So he manages uh, project, full-scale projects of accelerated beam testing, field instrumentation, and uh, pavement materials. Um, Dr. Garg got his uh, bachelor's uh, from the National Institute of Technology in India, and then his master's from the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. And finally, his doctorate uh, from here uh, at UIT. So um, we are very excited to your presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Garg. Please join me in, in welcoming. Uh, thank you very much, Lama. And again, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share a research program uh, with uh, you know, your group and other invitees uh, who are attending this session. And I would have loved to be there in person and make this presentation like I did in 2017. But because of pandemic, uh, we have travel restrictions. So only mission critical travel is allowed. So I couldn't make it there and meet you all in person. Hopefully sometimes in the near future, I'll be able to do that. Yeah, I, I spent five years in Urbana-Champaign at UIUC from 1993 to 98, working with Professor Thompson and other professors. So what I'm going to present today is the asphalt payment research for airport payments that is taking place here in Atlantic City. Here's my presentation outline. I'll start with a brief introduction of uh, the group that I work with and our facilities, and then go into P401 hot mix asphalt specifications, a little bit of history and currently what we have, and then go into different asphalt properties that are used in pavement thickness design. And then talk about research projects that are going on at both our research facilities, NAPMAR and NAPTF. And a little bit about the software Panda AP that is currently under development. And briefly mention other research projects that we have going on on the site. And then take a few minutes to talk about this new airport asphalt pavement technology program uh, because this is what can provide some funding opportunities for people in research areas, and then summarize my talk. So I work for Airport Technology R&D branch. Uh, our manager is Dr. Michelle Hoan, and we have nine full-time employees, FAA employees. Uh, Jeff Gagnon, he's the manager of the payments team. And then we have other individuals who are running different projects and programs. We are based in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Uh, that's where FA's William J. Hughes Technical Center is located. And most of the FA research, not just in payments, but other fields takes place here in Atlantic City. For our branch, our sponsor is the FA Office of 
Airport Safety and Standards that is based in Washington, DC. And they maintain a set of advisory circulars. And we do research to update those advisory circulars. And here at Tech Center, our branch is supported by our support contractors. We have applied research associates and GDIT. Uh, we work with some consultants and with different universities through grants and other contract agreements. And then we have interagency agreements and memorandum of agreements with ERDEC and FHWA. And we also work with different international partners like the DGAC of France and the airport authorities in South Africa and Korea. So FAA's Office of Airport administers Airport Improvement Program or the AIP program. Uh, that's a $3.4 billion a year program. And all this money is spent on making improvements at different airports and the breakup is shown in this chart here. So when you look at it, 76% of the money goes on pavements, runways, taxiways, and aprons. So you're looking at roughly two and a half billion dollars a year being spent on pavement projects. And any airport that uses AIP funding has to follow FAA's advisory circulars that provide standards and specifications for pavement thickness design, pavement materials, and construction. And we do research to update these advisory circulars and the design procedures that are required for payment thickness design. Here is a satellite image of our research facilities. Uh, we have NAPTF, uh, the facility that was built in 1999, and attached to it is the material testing laboratory. We are currently in the design phases of another material testing laboratory that will go somewhere in this location. And then we have National Airport Payment and Materials Research Center that was built in 2015. And we have material processing facility that we use during construction activities, construction of test sections at our facilities. So if you see NAPTF is fully enclosed, it's an indoor facility, whereas at NAPMARC, we have indoor test lanes. There are two test lanes that are covered and four outdoor lanes. Here's a photograph from NAPTF. Uh, we have this big machine that weighs 1.2 million pounds and can simulate any current or future landing gear configuration. Uh, if you're using single wheel, we can go up to 100,000 pounds. And for a six wheel gear, we can go up to 75,000 pounds. And we can move these two carriages closer to each other to look at gear proximity tests, uh, effects on pavement from gear proximity. And since we're using full scale landing gear here, we are looking at failures occurring in the lower layers of pavement structures because of wheel load interaction. And this whole machine is automated so the operator can program and leave, sit in his uh, office on the side here. And the machine will operate automatically. It knows where to start, where to stop, when to change, the carriage position because we apply wander in our traffic. And this wander is based on wander studies or measurements we have done at different airports. And let's say your section number two fails, the machine can load the first section, lift the wheels in the transition and not apply any loads on the failed section and then continue loading in the following section. We can apply different wheel loads. And all these payments are fully instrumented. We have signal processing units that are uh, on this wall and it's connected through a fiber optic network. And this is the location of our control room where you can see the results from sensors, et cetera. Now this is an indoor test facility. So the maximum temperature we get during peak summer is around 90 degrees. And this slide shows the evolution of commercial aircraft fleet over time. So what you see on this left-hand side was the first aircraft that was used for commercial flights. Very simple landing gear, wheel loads much lower, you know, about 10 to 15,000 pounds. Then late 60s, early 70s came Boeing 747 with a four-wheel landing gear. And the wheel loads went up to 40,000 pounds. 
And then in early 90s, we had these two new aircraft, Boeing 777 and A380, that had six-wheel landing gear. And these are the aircraft that necessitated the need for building NAPTF to collect performance data under this six-wheel landing gear. And that was mainly for the International Civil Aviation Organization's ACN PCN methodology. Because based on that, uh, very few airports in the world would be able to land six wheel landing gears. And again, that is because that pro procedure was very empirical in nature. And then when you look at uh, recent years, we have these two aircraft, Boeing 787 or the Dreamliner and Airbus A350. Uh, which have wheel loads approaching almost 70,000 pounds because aircraft manufacturers are trying to extend the range of these aircraft, which means they have to carry more fuel, but they don't want to reduce wheel well volume. So the wheel load and the tire pressure goes up. And these two charts show how the wheel loads have changed over time. So as you move from left to right, shows the increase in wheel loads. So in the current commercial aircraft fleet, a350-900 has the highest wheel load, uh, which is 73,300 pounds. For Dash 1000, they had to go for a six wheel landing gear. So we have enough load capacity with our test equipment. So if the aircraft industry goes up with higher loads, we can still test those payments in our facility to see how those increased loads would affect payment performance. And this particular chart shows increase in tire pressures that have gone up from 214 PSI to 254 PSI now. So to look at the effect of these increased tire pressures and wheel loads on asphalt pavements, since we could not test at higher temperatures at NAPTF, NAPMARC was developed and built in 2015 because for surface layers, you're not really interested in the whole landing gear because you see minimum wheel load interaction taking place for the surface layers. So we got this heavy vehicle simulator that was designed and built by Dynatest. So we can apply up to 100,000 pound wheel load and increase the pavement temperature to up to 150 degrees, two inches below pavement surface. So you're looking at surface temperatures of around 160, 170 degrees. And we can maintain that even during winter months when your outside temperature is minus 10, minus 15, or test temperature in the pavement is still around 120 degrees. And we also have a dual wheel assembly uh, that represents a 737-800 landing gear. And we have capability of applying wonder during our tests. And then this particular thing, sustainability, recently gained importance. So FAA came, up, came out with this document, Destination 2025 in 2018. It talks about reducing aviation's carbon footprint, investing in new technology, and advancing other innovations that promote environmentally friendly solutions. Now, this document does not really talk about payments, but the things mentioned can be very well applied for payment research also. And a big, uh, issue right now is reducing embodied carbon of transportation infrastructure. Because when you hear that 29% of greenhouse gases are contributed by the transportation sector, that is all coming from the use phase, basically tailpipe emissions. It does not account for the embodied carbon, which is the inherent greenhouse gases when you, cons uh, what do you call, prepare these materials, you know, crude distillation, the energy spent in there, then bringing that asphalt material to plants, making asphalt mixes, construction activities, all that is inherent to that structure. So it has to be addressed before you even start your payment design. So some of the research that we are doing at NAPMARC will be fulfilling objectives listed in destination 2025. And it talks about four steps that we need to take improve scientific knowledge of environmental impacts, develop effective decision support tools, because currently we do not use any kind of life cycle assessment or computation of embodied carbon to decide on what kind of payment we want to build. Foster research and development and develop sustainable airport facilities. So 
what we are doing currently at Napmark is evaluating new asphalt material technologies uh, under full scale tests so that we can generate performance data. And then we can see whether these materials can be used on airports or not. So we are comparing performance of these materials with standard FAA materials. And we are looking at recycled materials, warm mix asphalts currently. Because once we have the performance data, we can see how it compares with standard materials. Then we can start developing standards and specifications included in our specifications or advisory circulars. And that's what will increase the use of these new material technologies. So next I'll talk about P401 hot mix asphalt specifications. P401 is a specification uh, in FAA advisory circular for hot mix asphalt. So the first advisory circular that talked about construction of airports was issued in June of 1959. And in this specification book, they provided gradations that were to be used for asphalt mix design. Engineer was to select the amount of asphalt content depending on whether it was gravel or slag. And you needed minimum of 92% theoretical max density. And rolling was prescribed with a 10 ton roller immediately after material placement. And they were supposed to continue rolling until all roller marks were eliminated. And then different changes were made to these specifications in 1984. Percent within limits was added. This is a statistical based methodology for acceptance of construction and also coming up with pay factors. And then engineering brief 59 in 2001 provided guidance about super pave use of gyratory compactor. In 2005, P403 specification was added. So the material requirements for P403 are still same as P401. The acceptance criteria is slightly relaxed compared to P401. And P403 is generally used for as a asphalt stabilized base. And then 5370-10G that was released in 2014 added super pave mix design because till 2014, all HMA mix design was done using Marshall mix design procedure. And we added super pave mix design, not because we had any problems with Marshall mix designs. These mixes were performing well on airports. It's just that it was getting difficult to find labs that have Marshall mix design equipment. So when you look at this chart uh, for Marshall mix design, there are two tests included in the specification, the stability test and the flow number test. So these two tests gave you some idea about the rut resistance and the cracking resistance of the mixes. But with gyratory design criteria, there was no performance test attached because super pave mix design really never came out with any performance tests. So we were working, uh, doing research, US Army Corps of Engineers or ERDEC was doing research and the version of 5370 that was released in 2018, 10H, included some performance tests. Uh, it provides you criteria for selecting asphalt binder. So what it says is that you look at the location of the airport and see what is the base binder grade specified by your state DOT. And then depending on the maximum gross weight of the aircraft and the location of the pavement, whether it's an apron, taxiway or runway, it provided guidance on how to bump the binder grades. And then it added APA test as the performance test to limit rutting. And uh, we worked with the APA manufacturer to develop this APA that could apply 250 PSI hose pressure. The standard APA applies 100 PSI hose pressure. So we did some research to provide guidance for 100 PSI APA also in case the project did not have access to 250 PSI host pressure. And some states west of Mississippi heavily use Hamburg wheel test. So a guidance was added for uh, Hamburg wheel test. And uh, what you see on this chart is the relationship between APA rutting with 250 PSI host pressure and 100 PSI host pressure. 
And that's the data that we use to come up with the criteria for 100 PSI host pressure. So if you have 254 PSI host pressure, the rutting at the end of 4,000 passes was limited to 10 millimeters. And if it's a 100 PSI host pressure, then it was limited to five millimeters at 8,000 passes. We also compared these results with full-scale tests under HVS. So on the y-axis is number of HVA passes to get one inch of rutting. That is our failure criteria in full-scale tests. And on the x-axis, you see APA rutting at 4,000 passes at 254 PSI host pressure. So you can see there is a trend uh, that you can use APA data to predict rutting performance. Another test we looked at and also currently looking at is the high temperature IDT test. It's a much simpler test to perform. Uh, you can perform this test using a Marshall press, which most of the labs have, and even can be used during production time to make changes to your mix. And what you see in this chart is the data from APA rutting and high temperature IDT. And since both the tests uh, relate to rutting, there is a very high degree of correlation between the test results. And here you see HVS rutting compared with high temperature IDT. And there are other tests that we perform, four point bending beam fatigue tests, dynamic modulus tests, flow number tests. Next, I'll talk about what asphalt properties are used in pavement thickness design over the years as the design procedure evolved. Uh, so what you see on this slide is a nomograph because previous to 1994, all pavement thickness designs were done using nomographs given in advisory circular 5320. So this version was released in 1963. And what you see is the pavement thickness design was a function of the landing gear the type of subgrade soil you had and the wheel loads. For asphalt, they provided you thickness three inches for critical areas and two inches for non-critical areas. And they had these charts for different landing gear configurations. This is 5320-6A released in 1967. And here what you see is the thickness of the asphalt was increased by an inch for critical and non-critical areas to four inches and three inches. And then these are the charts from advisory circular 6D. And again, most of the thickness designs were mainly for the base and sub-base, not for the asphalt thickness. And then in 1993, when Boeing 777 came out, and <clears throat> if 777 was there in your traffic mix, you had to use LED FAA to do thickness design. And LED FA was based on layered elastic analysis. So the modulus value for asphalt surface layer was fixed at 200,000 PSI. And the assumption was that this is the modulus of asphalt mix at 90 degree temperature. Poison's ratio was fixed at 0.35. And for P403 or the stabilized base, the modulus was fixed at 400,000. And the reasoning there was that asphalt stabilized base is below the surface, so pavement temperatures are going to be lower, so the modulus will be higher. And same properties continue into the current version. The current version of advisory circular for pavement thickness design is 5320-6G that was released in June of 2021. And it still carries those same material properties for both the asphalt surface and the stabilized base the modulus of 200,000 PSI and 400,000 PSI and Poisson's ratio of 0.35. So what research are we doing at NAPMARC currently? So this is a flow chart that explains uh, the research at NAPMARC. Uh, the main objective is evaluation of new asphalt technologies for airfield pavements. So we're looking at warm mix asphalts, wrapped, full depth rehabilitation. And again, the reason for doing this research is to develop performance data so that they can be included in our standards and specifications. So we're doing extensive laboratory tests to look at rutting, fatigue behavior, durability, low temperature cracking, and then doing full-scale tests, trying to relate those lab characterization properties to the performance under full-scale testing. 
And then we also go to different airports and collect mixes from there that we can test in our lab and then monitor performance of those pavements in field. And here is a flow chart for a typical test cycle at Mapmark. The first step is to come up with research objectives. Based on that, we design our pavements cross sections, construct those pavements, install sensors accordingly. And once we complete the construction, then we do non-destructive testing to characterize what we built and what kind of variability exists in the pavement structure. And after that, we do some response tests at different load levels and then our traffic tests till complete structural failure. And then we look at the failure mechanism by cutting trenches. So we completed test cycle one in 2017 and the findings from test cycle one are published in this TRB paper. And the objectives of test cycle one was to study the effect of increased aircraft tire pressure on asphalt pavement performance and also evaluate warm mix asphalts can they be used on airport pavements compare their performance with standard p401 and also look at the effect of polymer modified binders on the performance of asphalt pavement what kind of improvement do you get in life and all those findings are summarized in this trb paper so the objectives for test cycle two became comparing performance of warm mix asphalt with HMA performance in high temperature rutting and also in fatigue. And we know warm mix asphalts can be produced using different kinds of additives, waxy additive, organic additive, chemical, and hybrid. So we wanted to see are all warm mix asphalts similar. And in CC1, we did not do any fatigue tests. So fatigue test became part of test cycle two. And in two of the lanes, we used a mixture of recycled asphalt pavement wrap along with warm mix asphalt. And this particular mix was used on a major commercial airport in US. So we wanted to test out the performance of this. We changed our pavement cross sections compared to test cycle one. In test cycle one, we had five inch thick asphalt surface, 12 inches of crushed stone base, and 12 inches of sub base, which was also crushed material. And our subgrade here is a CBR15 sandy subgrade. So we increased asphalt thickness to nine inches. So we removed four inches of P209 crushed stone base. So all the lanes had nine inch thick asphalt surface and eight inch thick crushed stone base over a sandy subgrade. Uh, outdoor lanes, we had our control lane that was P401 hot mix asphalt. And then we had three lanes with warm mix asphalt and the binder grade was PG76 minus 22 in all those lanes. The two indoor lanes, one lane, lane six had nine inches of warm mix with 20% wrap included. And on lane five, top three inches was just warm mix asphalt, the bottom six inches had warm mix and 20% wrap included. This is the layout of our test sections, the outdoor lane. So this is a control lane, lane one, that had P401 HMA. Lane two had Evotherm or the chemical additive for warm mix asphalt. Lane three had organic additive, which is Sasobit. And lane four had Edvera, which is the hybrid additive. And then these are the two indoor lanes, five and six. So we have already completed high temperature rutting tests on all the six lanes. We are currently doing fatigue tests. So we have completed lane six. We are currently testing lane five. And we started testing at 63,000 pound wheel loads when we did not see any signs of cracking around 90,000 90, passes. We increased the wheel load to 72,000 pounds. And after applying a total of 140,000 passes, we stopped fatigue testing because we did not see any changes in our pressure cell readings in the lower layers in asphalt strain gauges. So we knew we are not going to see any kind of fatigue crack. So in lane five, we started our testing at 72,000 pound wheel load at higher wheel loads. We have completed about 60,000 passes. And again, we still don't see any evidence of cracking. 
or even any changes? Because once you have micro cracks develop, you start seeing increase in vertical stresses in the lower layers. We don't see any of that. And we have made a decision that we are going to test these lanes for up to 75,000 passes, because that's typically how many passes you would get on a major airport under these heavy aircraft Boeing 777 in 10 year period. This chart shows the high temperature rutting performance. And as you can see, this is a control lane, the line with circles, P401 HMA. Uh, the one with organic additive showed very similar performance, the SASO bit. The one with chemical additive, Evotherm, showed slightly better performance. And the two lanes that had RAP included, of course, RAP is a stiffer material, so we saw better rutting performance. This red line that you see, that's our failure criteria, a one inch of surface rut. And the findings from these high temperature ruttings are published in this TRB paper that was published in 2021. So for fatigue tests, we decided to age our pavement test sections before starting tests. So we are aging these sections at 120 degrees Fahrenheit measured at two inch depth below pavement surface. And we position HVS over the test lane, turn on the heaters to 120 degrees, and we let the HVS sit there for 14 days. So that's about 336 hours of aging at this temperature. And after 14 days, we turn off the heater, remove the insulation panels, and let the pavement temperature stabilize to ambient temperature conditions. And then we put our insulation panels back and start fatigue tests. And we are performing these fatigue tests at a pavement temperature of 68 degree Fahrenheit, two inches below the pavement surface. So during winter months, we had to use our heating panels to maintain 68 degrees. But for summer months, we would need to cool down our pavement. So uh, we acquired this cooling system that will be connected to HVS during summer months. So this cooling system can take pavement temperatures down to 50 degrees, two inches below pavement surface and maintain the temperature when the outside temperature is up to 120 degrees. Another thing uh, that we are planning to do at NAPMARC once we complete our fatigue test on lane 5S is this French ovalization test. So the French DGAC, their Civil Aviation Research Center, they have developed this ovalization device. Uh, last couple of years, we have been seeing a lot of slippage taking place at high-speed exits at different airports. Uh, because at high-speed exits, the aircraft are braking and also turning. So very high shear stresses. And we did an instrumentation project at Newark International Airport to identify when that slippage starts. So the French have developed this device that can look at the interface condition between the two asphalt lifts. So it's a uh, displacement-based strain transducers that are used in this particular device. And by the way, this device is printed using a 3D printer so you take a core out of your payment structure, position this device just above the interface, measure responses, and the strains are measured in three directions. So you have one direction, then perpendicular to that, basically the three principal axis, and you get your strain responses. And if you look at the figure on your right-hand side, if the two layers are fully bonded, then you'll have a continuous strain profile as shown by this green line. For partially bonded lifts, you start seeing changes in the strain magnitudes and the nature of the strain changes. And once you have a sliding surface or no bond between the two layers of the interface, then you have uh, you know, big differences in the strain magnitudes and one is compressive and the other one is tensile in nature. So French have done tests using HWD uh, on the payment structures. We will be using HVS and look at the effect of temperature offset from the core hole of the wheel load, different wheel loads, different speeds. And we'll be doing these tests at two different temperatures. And we plan on positioning this particular device first at close to the surface of the core hole 
then at the bottom of the pore hole, and then five millimeters, five millimeters above and below the asphalt interface. So that is the research activities at Mapmark. Next, I'll talk about what's going on at our National Airport Payment Test Facility. We are currently testing construction cycle nine. Uh, odd number construction cycles are for flexible pavements. And the objectives of CC9 are to verify, refine, modify the fatigue model that is based on the ratio of dissipated energy change or RDEC that has been implemented in far field. And again, this is based on the research done at University of Illinois by Professor Sam Carpenter. And also look at the effect of P209 layer thickness on payment life. For those of you who have used far field, you will see that slight changes in P209 layer thickness has a very significant effect on payment life. And it doesn't make much sense. So we're testing it out with full-scale tests in CC9. Then we are looking at the effect of geosynthetics use on flexible payment performance. Because uh, in our previous test cycles, before our subgrade failed, we had failure in our sub-base layers because you know, unbound aggregates cannot take any tensile stresses. And basically you see those materials separate and you see subgrade intrusion into the subbase, and that's when your subgrade failure starts. So we are using geosynthetics to see how it affects that failure mode. We are looking at performance of cement treated permeable base. And then there are two sections where we are looking at the strain criteria for allowable overload. Because in the IKO standard, for flexible payments, 10% overload operations are allowed. And again, that 10% number was pulled out of the air. There is no research behind it. So we did some tests in our construction cycle seven, and we're doing a nine to see how many overload operations can you really allow before your payment starts seeing significant damage. And we are using these bender element sensors that was developed by Dr. Errol Tutumler at UIUC. So they have been installed to quantify the localized stiffness increase around the geogrid layer. This is the layout of test sections. So these four test sections, first four, are called the fatigue model test sections. We'll use data from these to verify our fatigue model. And the payment cross sections are shown on the right-hand side. Then layer LFC 3N and 3S are the sections where we have geogrids. So in 3N, we have a geotextile separation layer, separation fabric between uh, sub-base and the subgrade. And then at the interface of the sub-base and the base, we have geogrid class B installed. And on the south side, we only have the separation layer. So comparing performance of these two sections would tell you the effect of geogrid on flexible payment performance. LFC 4S is the control section for LFC 3, north and south, because it's the same payment cross section, but with no fabric or the geogrid. And LFC 5, north and south are the overload operation uh, sections. So currently we have applied about 20,000 passes and testing still continues. And then there is another payment evaluation tool we are working on called PANDA or payment analysis using nonlinear damage approach for airports. So what you see in this slide is a typical flow chart for a mechanistic empirical design procedure. You have a structural model where you feed in the inputs, material properties, climate, traffic, to predict payment responses that are then related to your distresses through the use of transfer functions, which is the empirical part and that's developed based on full-scale tests. So no matter how good your structural model is, if your input properties do not represent what you're building, the output is not going to be of that great quality. So we have all these different material tests now available all around, and we are looking at all these material properties. So we need to have a structural model where we can use these material properties. And that's where Panda comes into picture. And 
using Panda, we can compare performance of different materials and different payment structures. So Panda is being developed under a research grant by uh, Texas A&M University and University of Kansas. Uh, these, there are, these are some screenshots from Panda. So asphalt layer can be modeled as an elastic layer, viscoplastic or viscoelastic. So the models for the asphalt layers have been pretty much finalized. Uh, we ended up spending much more time on the unbound aggregate materials because we wanted to capture the stress sensitivity of these materials and also be able to predict some kind of permanent deformation. And again, uh, these material models were developed, tested under Abacus, and then a 3D finite element program was developed that is free of uh, any commercial software so that we can distribute it free. And I just had a meeting yesterday. So hopefully by March of uh, next year, we should have a version of Panda that will have models implemented for all uh, the asphalt and the aggregate layers. Currently, the asphalt model works. Some other research projects that we have going on. Uh, some of these are based on research requests we get from our sponsors. So one is in-service performance of airport payments constructed following state specifications for highway materials. Uh, the FAA's reauthorization bill in 2018 allowed for the use of state highway specification materials for aircrafts where wheel loads are less than 60,000 pounds. Now, for a 60,000 pound gross weight aircraft, you're looking at wheel loads of around 25 to 28,000 pounds, which are almost double of what you see in highway payments. So we are looking at or collecting performance data from the airports that were constructed following state specification materials. And most of these airports were in the Midwest region, Illinois, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and some in uh, Georgia, et cetera. The final report is complete and it's going through the final editing process. So it should be out pretty soon. The other project was developing specification for use of nonlinear technology in measuring properties of unbound payment materials. Because currently the acceptance of aggregate base and sub base is strictly based on the density measurements. So we are looking at tools like uh, lightweight deflectometers, DP spa, et cetera. And that study is also complete and the report is going through internal review currently. Uh, University of Texas at El Paso, Dr. Sohail Nazarian, he was a PI on this project. And then we are developing minimum material construction and acceptance recommendations for P401, P403, and P404. Uh, this project is also complete, it was done by Rutgers University. And again, report is in the final stages of uh, editing. And there's another project on building machine learning based prediction models for computationally efficient airfield payment analysis. And Professor Imad Al Qadi is the PI on that project. Uh, he's using all the sensor data that we have collected from our full scale tests at NAPTF. And then to address sustainability, uh, we are currently developing a web based life cycle assessment tool for airport payments. Uh, Professor John Harvey at UC Davis is a PI on this project. He developed a LCA framework for airport payments under a research grant. And that report has been published and you can download it from FAA's website. And on this web-based LCA tool, Federal Highway Administration has partnered with us. So he'll be using open LCA tool developed by LCA Common and then tailor it for airport payments. Then we are looking at ways of characterizing stabilized bases, looking at surface treatments, seasonal frost and permafrost, some payment roughness issues. And then next I'll talk about this new program that we have started, uh, Airport Asphalt Payment Technology Program. In er early 2000s, we had this program, this was a line item in the budget where asphalt industry and concrete industry got funding to come up with projects that were more practical in nature and can be readily applied in field. And that project was discontinued uh, 
And in FAS 2018 reauthorization bill, Congress put the clause back again to give $3 million to concrete industry and $3 million to asphalt industry to come up with these research on concrete and asphalt payment technologies that extend life of airfield payments, develop and conduct training, provide for demonstration projects, and promote the latest airfield payment technologies to aid in the development of safer, more cost-effective, and more durable airfield payments. So the asphalt part of this program, AAPTP, is being administered by National Asphalt Payment Association, NAPA. So we have a cooperative agreement with them. Uh, Dr. Richard Willis is the PI on this program. And we have given them $9.5 million so far, three and a half million in fiscal year 20, three and a half, and then in 21 and 22, $3 million each. And it's modeled on the previous AAPTP program that was administered by Auburn University. And the website for this program is listed at the bottom here. And these are some screenshots from the website of AAPTP. So any new RFP basically shows up here. And there is a project coordination group that was set up that has people from industry, FAA headquarters, and NAPA. And they come up with what type of projects that needs to be done. And based on that, they develop RFPs that are put on this website. And so far, they've come up with seven projects. Uh, first one is guidance for selection of proper asphalt binder grade. So there'll be a uh, tool or computer program developed that will help you in selecting binder grade. And this was awarded to National Center for Asphalt Technology. The second project is the update of asphalt mixture paving handbook. And that project was awarded to Asphalt Institute. And then we want to develop performance tests to address both cracking and rutting. So we have two projects on balanced mix design, one on cracking and one on rutting. The project on cracking performance tests was awarded to University of Illinois, uh, Professor Alcade's PI. And then for rutting performance tests, the project was awarded to University of Nevada at Reno. And both these groups have other partners in their team. The fifth project is on the mitigation of plastic flow and delamination at high-speed exits. And this project was awarded to Rutgers University. And then the sixth project is improving performance of longitudinal joints in airfield pay asphalt payments. Because we did a study in 2004 on operational life of airport payments, and we found that the distress that results in maximum reduction of PCI is the deterioration of longitudinal joints. And this project has been awarded to National Center for Asphalt Technology. And the seventh project is on the feasibility of old central plant recycling asphalt mixtures for airports. And uh, I don't think this has been discussed or awarded yet. So to summarize, uh, we are basically generating performance data using full-scale tests at NAPTF and NAPMARC, extensive Laboratory tests are being performed to develop material properties database. And we have airport instrumentation projects where we go to an airport construction project, install sensors to collect payment performance and response information under the combined effect of environment and the aircraft loads. Working on non-destructive testing to upgrade the advisory circular. And all this data goes into updating failure models in a design program far field. The current version is version two that was released last year. And far field also, far field 2.0 also includes ACR PCR methodology that will replace ACN PCN methodology of ICAO. And then we are developing new payment analytical tool, Panda, trying to address sustainability uh, use increase the use of more green materials, material technologies in airport payments, have a PTP program that is trying to do research on projects that we are not doing at our facility. And we are doing all this in collaboration with different universities, research organization, and international agencies. And the main objective is to <clears throat> come up with specifications for materials, construction, and payment thickness design 
so that airport payments can handle the aircraft traffic of today and tomorrow in a safe and efficient way. And if you visit our website that is listed on the slide, you will find this document, FAA Airport Payment Research and Development 2030 Research Plan. So this is a rolling research plan that we update on a regular basis. And that will give you some idea of what kind of research we are looking at. And I'll end my presentation with this photograph from 2017 when I delivered the same Kent lecture at Atril. And here's two of my mentors, my gurus, Professor Thompson and Professor Dempsey. It was great to see them. I wish I was there in person today, but maybe soon. I've learned so much from these two gentlemen. And I would like to acknowledge my team here because you know, running these facilities is no easy task. So these are the people that are in my team at Napmark, both FA and my support contractors, people who are running the machine, analyzing the data and working with day-to-day -day activities. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gard, for the uh, very informative presentation. Um, I must say that we are out of time. So anybody that has to leave uh, can leave. But anybody that has any questions, um, I'm sure Dr. Gard um, can take a few. Nev? Yes, Professor. Uh, on Panda, uh, are you using stress dependency for the subgrades or just your granular materials? Well, right now it's mainly for the granular materials. And the idea is to move to subgrade also. So they're looking at different versions of Drucker Prager cap model because apparently. Uh, by modifying those models, you can address stress dependency and also plastic deformations for subgrade soils and the aggregate material. And that's where actually it has taken most time. Thank you. Um, Professor Gard, there is a question in the chat. Yes, uh, I'm just reading that on that uh, longitudinal joint. And yes, we are looking at VRAM materials and other joint sealants. So NCAT is working with a couple of other members of the team who have used these different materials. Um, Dr. Garg, I have a very small question. Uh, for sure. that French uh, sensor that you were talking about, the 3D printed one? Yes. You mentioned that you wanted to put it on the surface and between the, the layers. Why would you want to put it on the surface? Well, this is just to get some measurements close to the surface and at the bottom. Uh, but our main interest is really in around the in layer interface. And again, when you have data close to the surface and the bottom, you can do some finite element modeling. And the French have this 3D finite element model that they want to used to compare predicted responses with the measured responses at different levels in the payment structure in that core hole. And if you are interested, uh, they have a paper. I think that paper has already been published in ASTM Journal of Testing. Thank you, I, I will look that up. Any more questions? An update. I have a question. Sure. Kamal, Kamal here. So, for the for the test facility that you have in Atlanta, okay. So, so subgrade is constant. My my question is: We have lots of airport in different part of the country. Yes, in in mm -hmm. the US. So, so how valuable will be this field test result from Atlanta or New Jersey to other airport facilities in the in the US. How how you will be addressing that that issues in your result that you'll be obtaining 
from from probably over the next two decades actually this facility is a huge facility you'll be doing lots of field test uh, and you'll be obtaining lots of engineering parameters by doing testing different material mm -hmm. um, how you will translate this data result for other jurisdiction other geographic reason well, so at our facility, we have three different subgrade types, low strength, medium strength, and high strength. And our test construction cycle one, CC1, we tested flexible payments on all three subgrade levels. Okay, we collected error from there. And since then, all our testing for flexible payments has been on low strength subgrade. Because if you look at the location of airports, Airports are generally constructed at locations where you don't want to build anything. <laughs> or the soil conditions are very poor. So that's why we are concentrating most of our research on low strength subgrade. Because the whole idea is we want our payment to last 20 years on those weak subgrades. Payments generally do very well on medium strength or high strength subgrade. And I think with this sustainability becoming big, uh, you might even start seeing some modifications being done like lime stabilization or cement stabilization of subgrades so that you don't have very thick payment structures or the aggregate layers. And again, the design procedure itself considers the strength of the material. So depending on what are the strength properties of your subgrade, you account for that in your thickness design. Thanks, yeah, makes sense. We have one last question in the chat. Can you see it, Dr. Burke? Yes, I'm looking at it. Thanks a lot for the great is presentation. Is it possible to comment about the plan for grade bumping in the ANCAT project for binder selection? Is it based on the aircraft? Yeah, so the tool that they'll be preparing will still follow the same guidelines as listed in FAA's advisory circular, where the grade bump will be based on the aircraft weight and whether that payment is an apron, taxiway, or a runway. So it's like providing you with an app that you can put on your phone or iPad that once you put in all this pertinent information, it will tell you what binder grade to use. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gard. Uh, we will thank you one last time. Well, thank you. And if you come up with any other question, you know, my contact information is on the slide. Feel free to send me an email. And if you go to our website, airporttech.tc.fa.gov, you can access most of our research papers, all our research reports, and also look at the data that we have collected over different construction cycles and test cycles.